welcome. We're happy that you're here. We're, we get to watch today a very beautiful episode of Howard Storm's D&DE. And to introduce you to everyone and welcome you is our wonderful board member, Martin Tanner. Martin, could you come on and say hello to everyone and take, take it on over? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Welcome to this I am a sponsored event. I'm Martin Tanner, the current vice president of IONS. With me is filmmaker Todd Huey and Howard Storm, whose extraordinary near-death experience is the subject of the film you are about to see. So here's what's going to happen today. First, I'll briefly explain a few items of interest about IONS. Then I'm going to invite the filmmaker, Todd Huey, to explain his approach to the film and making it. Then I'll invite Howard Storm to tell you in a few words his thoughts about the accuracy and depiction of the film. Next, we're going to see the film, followed by questions and answers that you may have as an audience. So let's begin. It's an honor to be with you today. IONS invites you to see our publications and videos on our website, IONS.org, I-A-N-D-S.org, or on YouTube. We especially invite you to attend our annual conference in Arlington, Virginia, over Labor Day weekend. For details, please go to IONS.org on the internet. Todd, tell us about your film. First, how it fits into your Life Beyond Death TV series. Next, your approach to the film, filming something about the afterlife necessarily entails some creativity and attention to detail and accuracy. Then tell us how our audience or, or someone might be able to financially help complete this project. Over to you. Thanks, Martin. Um, everyone seems to be interested in NDEs wherever you go. We've all seen them on YouTube. We've seen them all over the place. But I was never satisfied with the visuals and the way the storytelling went. They tended to be somewhat flat narratives and there was emotion there, but I pitched the idea several years ago. Actually, I pitched originally to Mary Neal as a table, a round table thing. And uh, what ended up happening is, uh, you know, COVID showed up. And so that idea went out the window. And so they decided here at Answer Quest, which is uh, an entity that I work with, let's go ahead and do them as half hour episodes that we can combine into a feature film, or we can keep it as a ongoing anthology series, starting with the premise of its doctors, nurses, scientists, teachers, and first responders, the most trusted people in the world, regardless of culture, when you survey them. So then we said, well, how are we going to tell this visually? Because if I see another reenactment with a guy wearing fake little angel wings you buy at the costume shop, I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to throw up in my mouth. And so what ended up happening is we said, well, why don't we use artist renditions? like a combat artist, like a police artist, like a courtroom artist, but, and then we'll animate them simple animation and we'll put in sound design and dimensional design. And everyone, including my incredible editor and animator, Arturo Meza said, sure, we could do that. And like any good actor, you don't know what you're doing. You just say you can do that, and, but you can't do that. So we had to learn, we had to learn how to do it together. And that's why it takes so long and it costs so much. It costs $150,000 an episode for 30 minutes because there's so much editing time and post-production, which you'll see. So we did it with animation and I think it worked. Uh, Mary loved it, uh, Eben loved it. I think Howard did, everyone who saw it, they said it allows your imagination to take you into the NDE of the individual. And it doesn't add to the story, it augments the story and you accept it as an animated NDE. And it somehow, it really grabs people by their heart and their minds. So that's how we did. And so we did three episodes and we need $135,000 to finish the fourth episode, which is Mary Neal's part two, her after effects. And then the majority of episode two is Dr. Raj Party. Dr. Raj Party, if you guys have, have uh, followed him, he was the chief anesthesiologist, Bakersfield Hospital. He had a, a tragic NDE, died in the operating room. 
had veridical perception over to India, traveled to the gates of hell, was greeted by his father and told about generational curses. And then he meets with the archangels, Michael and Raphael. And he comes back so radically changed with the Damascus Road experience that he tells his, his Hindu wife, who's also a dentist, we're going to sell all this stuff and we're going to heal people here and here. And she was like, what? So the thing is, it's going to be a powerful episode. So anything you can put in is great. And if any of you want to explore other financial options, contact me at lifebeyonddeath.tv. And I think Angela is going to put it up, lifebeyonddeath.tv. Contact us. That goes to me if you know anybody who wants to have a more substantial part of it. That's all I can say because we're a nonprofit and you're not allowed to publicize. But I think you read between the lines. Otherwise, Martin will sue me because he's an attorney. <laughs> so anyway, does that answer the, the basic questions? It does. It does. Tell us one last thing before we turn it over to Howard, which is your attention to accuracy. Because when you say animation, some people think, well, there were liberties taken. This is more like a documentary than animation typically is. Well, a courtroom artist, a police artist, a combat artist specialize in trying to catch the flavor of the moment. So what we would do, like in Howard's case, I took Howard's interview gave it to the artists. In this case, there were four. This is the most visually complicated of all that we've done. So we handed it to Darius Corey, our primary, Hugh J. Matsumuro out of Kyoto, Japan, Kevin Tumlinson down in Texas, and Sarah Mills, who's here in North Carolina. And I handed it to them and I said, okay, guys, you take this, you take this, you take this based upon your style. And then what they did is they listened to what Howard said, and then they came up in their own mind, what would the visuals be if I was in Howard's shoes? So it's an interpretation. But what we wanted to get is get the emotion of the NDE, whether it's Mary, Howard, or Eben Alexander. And we want to get the emotion there and convey it visually, and then add music and sound effects, and of course, very good editing, and it worked. I, I was look. I was ready to you know look into that truck driving job, you know, because if this didn't work, I was I was out, you know. But I think it worked. <laughs> I'll let Howard tell you if he thinks it works, but um, that's that's why we chose the the way that we did. It's spectacular, Howard. Tell us how you think it worked, and then we'll see the film. I've done interviews. I've been on TV shows. Um, I've done hundreds and hundreds of these kinds of things. And this is the most accurate depiction of what I experienced of all of them. Um, Todd will agree, he never, He's never given me a penny. I'm not paid to say this. I'm not making any money off this. <laughs> People always tell me I'm making money off this stuff, which is interesting because I get to see the money. Um, they've done a great job. And I'm so thankful to Todd because so often after I've done um, a show, an interview, whatever, I have that put it in Kentucky language, uh, which is where I live in Kentucky, is sometimes I feel road hard and put up wet. You know, um, Todd didn't do that. He was as faithful as any person could be to um, what I said. And I, I hope that, uh, and I know, I, I don't hope, I know that uh, Todd was very sincere in his interest being as absolutely um, honest and straightforward in uh, what he did with my story, which I consider to be a sacred thing. So I'm a pretty uh, astute and harsh critic of what people do with my story. Sometimes um, I've not been very happy. I, I am thrilled and I hope that this gets a lot of distribution and I really hope that the people that are watching this day can uh, support the work that uh, they're doing it life beyond death and uh, the dedication and the work that Todd and, and company have done. Can, can I thank you briefly, Martin? Can yes, please. You? The accuracy that Howard talks about, I'm a degreed historian. 
And one thing I noticed and had heard from other people that had NDEs is that producers will edit out that which they do not want the person mm -hmm. to talk about. <laughs> I cannot do that. If I'm going to have any integrity in this life, I have to be able to tell their story and get myself out of the way. That's what my professional training did. Whether I agree or disagree doesn't matter. It's to tell Howard's story, to tell Mary's story, to tell Eben's story, and it'll be to tell Raj's story. And so that's so important to me. And it's unfortunate that our, in the television world, we've got so many people who want to cut out what they don't want to hear. And um, I think that's what makes us different, is we are willing to put in what they said. Honesty means let the facts take you where they go and not try to cherry pick them into what you hope is the direction they want to take you. Fabulous. Well, well described. And thank you for your honesty. Let's go to the episode now and have Q&A answers afterward. So Todd, please start the episode. Okay. Since the dawn of humanity, over 108 billion people have lived on the earth. Of that number, more than 100 billion have already died. The simple truth is this, everyone dies and so will you. So what happens after you die? Is there an afterlife or a continuing consciousness? In a world full of conflicting opinions about this issue, whose opinion should you trust? Opinion survey professionals say the top five most trusted professions are doctors, nurses, scientists, teachers, and first responders. Join us as we examine how these trusted individuals dealt with the single most traumatic event that changed their lives forever, their own deaths. This is their story of life beyond death from the NDE Files. John Burke is the pastor of Gateway Church in Austin, Texas. He is also an avid researcher of over 1,000 near-death experiences and has written the New York Times and Amazon best-selling book, Imagine Heaven. Well, I wrote Imagine Heaven actually after about 30 plus years of research. Um, and I wrote it for two reasons. One, to convince skeptics like I was, I was a skeptic when I first encountered the very first research about near-death experiences. I changed my mind. I became convinced. I believe that for skeptics, this is empirical, scientific, medical evidence uh, that there really is an afterlife, there really is a God, and uh, this is not just local, this is global evidence. One of the most disturbing parts of near-death experiences is that they're not all good. Hellish near-death experiences are difficult to research because they're so rare. I've only found about one, maybe two percent of near-death experiences truly describe a hellish realm. And they are extremely frightening. Hellish near-death experiences describe content and occurring, things occurring to the near-death experiencer that is far more frightening and far more vivid than any scary stories I've ever read in my life. They are truly horrific. I consider myself an authority on hell. I know that hell is vast, and I knew that the only way that I could ultimately survive in that place was to become as bad a predator as they were to me. They were indoctrinating me into boot camp. I knew that the only way to survive down there was to become, join the gang and become a predator, which I um, really didn't want to do. And the thing that troubled me was, is that the sense of hopelessness and the sense of being in this place and becoming one of the inhabitants of this place with time without end was very unappealing. And so I'm just sinking into utter, utter despair. And in that despair, my mind recalled 
Myself, as a child, maybe eight or nine years old, in a Sunday school classroom singing, Jesus Loves Me. That was remarkable. So, so Howard, one more time, give us your thoughts about that portrayal in the film, and then we'll take questions. Um, <laughs> you know, I've seen this film a couple of times and it got to me again. Um, I really don't like watching myself. I don't like hearing myself, but um, some of the things I said um, <laughs> really got to me because I really believe, um, and I thank Todd for including this because it's never been included before in anything I've ever done of the hundred things I've done. You take it to the man and he'll show up. If you do it from your heart, he'll show up and you're gonna like it a whole lot. So that, to me, that was the, um, the coup de grace about the old self in the beginning of a whole new self. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's, let's start off with a couple of key questions. Over and over, you talked about this was Jesus that, that saved you. And, and the other point is it was Jesus and, and he did save you. So although we talk about negative near-death experiences or hellish near-death experiences, in the end, this was a wonderful, positive near-death experience for, for you. And, and that cannot be overemphasized. Everything, e even these bad experiences that you had, influenced you ultimately to move in, in a better direction, to sort of correct your, your course, if you will. Is that a fair summary? Well, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Next question is, in connection with that, how do you know this was Jesus? Do you just think it was, or is that an assumption? Or I people want to know how you knew that was Jesus. Did he come and say, hi, Howard, I'm Jesus? Or was it something else? What? Yeah. what? <laughs> um, several factors. One is um, when he came, I knew it was him. I'm, and I knew without a doubt it was him. But I had a very long experience with Jesus. When people asked me how long it was, I said, much longer than uh, graduate school, which, by the way, was three years. Um, I spent a lot of time with him, and uh, he and I talked extensively, and one of the things that we talked about was his life when he was in this world, um, some of which, a little tiny bit of which is recorded in uh, the Bible and the Gospels. And so um, besides just talking about those things, we went to some of those places, um, and got to witness what he had experienced, what had happened in his life. Um, there is no doubt in my mind <laughs> that he was the real deal. Someone asks, is there a specific um, Bible version that you recommend? Um, well, when I went to seminary, we were encouraged to read lots of Bibles. And um, if you look on my bookshelf behind me, you'll see about 20 different Bibles. Um, I like the ones that are in contemporary English, like um, the RSV, the NRSV, the NIV, the, the EV, um, you know, et cetera. I, I like the ones that are comprehensible. Um, I, when I do the 23rd Psalm, I do it King James. I like all the these and thous and stuff like that. But when um, most of the time I want to read stuff that's in uh, the English that I know and not um, archaic English. Um, next question that's, that's up here is a, a comment that this is from Jan Holden, IANS president, that, that it was a beautiful presentation. And her question is, in the world at large, Christianity is, is actually a minority. Um, uh, although 
of all the world religions, Christianity is still slightly larger than, than Islam. It's still a minority when you compare the entire world's population. So what relevance does your experience have for all the rest of those people who are actually the majority of, of the people on the planet today? Right. Um, my understanding is a mere two and a half billion Christians in the world out of a population of about um, uh, 800 uh, billion people in the world, um, significantly larger than any other religion. But anyways, her, her question is quite relevant. Um, Jesus was asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, uh, I'm paraphrasing, keep it simple, love God with all you got, and love your neighbor as yourself. And as far as I know, um, Jesus meant that. He said that to one of his uh, Jewish brothers. And I feel that that um, is the, sort of the, the main instruction of Christianity. And when we talk about knowing the name of someone or say, saying the name of one, in the biblical tradition, when we say like in the name of God or in the name of Jesus, what that means is in the knowing of them. Um, my grandmother, who was from Finland, uh, didn't know the word J-E-S-U-S. -S. Uh, she knew it, the, the Finnish version of it, right? And actually, uh, J-E-S-U-S -S is um, English. Uh, it's not his real name, it was Yeshua, um, who my rabbi friend, friend corrects me every time I say Jesus. He says, you mean Yeshua? Yeah. Um, it's the knowing of them, knowing the love, loving them, receiving their love, and transmitting that love to the people around us. That's, um, that's, that's what Christianity is supposed to be about, and that's theoretically what we share with them all good religions and there and most religions i have a lot of good in them some of them have um not so much but some do and uh i think christianity has a lot to share with this world and i am a proselytizer i am a fanatical evangelist of the message of jesus <laughs> a quick follow-up would you then say that <clears throat> the highest truths that you learned about your near-death experience, which would be love and service ought to be universal and you could share them or impart them with absolutely anybody, whether they're of a different faith or of no faith at all. Martin, you said it. Um, amen, <laughs> ditto. <laughs> yep. Okay, fair enough. Um, the next comment here is is kind of a fascinating one. It's, it starts off uh, with a little background, which which I'll um, skip over here and get to the point. It says that, uh, do you remember sit, sitting in the backyard as a small child, looking up at the clouds and asking God, if you are real, please show yourself to me. And then she says that this has sustained, uh, sustained her throughout her her life your comment on that well, um wonderful i um i've spent a number of years doing paintings of clouds <laughs> i don't know if anybody gets out of it what i hope i put into it but um, todd's seen a bunch of those skyscapes um and when i look into the sky and look at the clouds and most especially sunrises and sunsets and reflections in the water, you know, and all, all those things associated with the sky. Um, I feel a very closeness to God. You know, it's really frustrating as an artist because I can't do a picture of God. It's not possible. I've never seen one. I don't think anyone's done one. Um, so I do paintings of God by showing God's beautiful creation. Thank you. Next question. It, it kind of comes down to the 
crux of, of God's view of everyone, even the people who are on a different path. It says, do you think that people who are souls who feel separate from God, and, and I'll sort of um, interject in here a, away from him or who may not even believe in him, will all be welcomed and given grace and forgiveness even if they reject God? Or, or will they be, be lost forever? What's, what's your thought about this? So it, the, the thought here at the very end, cut to the chase, is do you think anyone will be allowed to suffer endlessly? Or, or maybe I'll add forced to suffer endlessly if they want to look up to God. Um, let me answer that by first making it clear that um, I don't speak for God. And I'm very aware of that. <laughs> so this is my opinion, a topic that I've studied and researched and prayed and thought about and um, searched the Bible for the right answers. And my answer is this. God wants everybody to go to heaven. To put it another way, God wants everybody to be saved. But God has given us this interesting um, God-like feature that no creature in the world has ever been given, which is free will. In other words, we all can make choices and we can accept or reject God and the graces, the gifts that God wants to give us, which are love, hope, faith, etc. So um, what happens to people when they die? I believe that God is a re rehabilitative God, not a God who punishes. I utterly reject the idea that God is into punishing and believe that God is into rehabilitating. So, therefore, if there is any way to rehab a person, God will. He will purge them, and they will have experiences like I had. That's what God, God gave me, a rehab experience. God wasn't punishing me by letting me experience hell. He was giving me exactly what I had sought in my life. I had chosen hell. Within my heart, I had chosen hell, and God said, you want it, baby? Here. Here. Because God in his infinite wisdom knew there was something deep down inside that little child, you know, um, and he knew I was going to find out. And, and if God will do that for me, God would do that for anyone. It may mean... Um, being stripped down to the core of your divine spark and losing your entire personality. You know, some people are going to require a lot of refinement. And the Bible says God's love is like refining fire. Um, you know, taking that ore and bringing it up to uh, 2,500 or more degrees uh, might be a, something of a painful experience. That's what refiners do, you know, and taking the uh, unwanted elements out and reducing it down to gold. But I think that there, I would like to believe that there's gold, pure gold in everyone, and God's going to get to that gold. So um, that's what I'm hoping. But um, God is good. God is merciful. God is kind. God is love. And I rest my case right there. <laughs> Next question, which I'll paraphrase a little bit here. You had a long career in art. Do you still use art to, shall, shall we say, um, share your narrative experience or the values that you learned in it? Well, thanks for the question, because... Yeah, I'm still painting and sculpting. I just finished a, a sculpture series, The Seven Last Words of Jesus. Unfortunately, I haven't found any audience for my artwork. I'm I'm hoping someday that someone will show some. I am I I pursued a career exhibiting my work, and I had work in museums, and I sold work through galleries. And after my near death experience, um, that all disappeared from me because the Everyone said, we, we, can't, we don't want to see that stuff. We can't show that stuff. We can't sell stuff. So I'm creating a vast collection of Howard Storm 
uh, God-inspired work. And I'm hoping someday that I'll find a, um, a venue that would be interested in it. Next question. Do you interpret your near-death experience as an example of being born again, a phrase that many religious people would find in their faith? Oh, um, yeah. People have asked me if I have asked me when I've done my talk if I was born again, and it's like, um, how about I died and I'm a completely different person? Is that sufficient for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, here's an interesting question. If God knows us fully, do you have an opinion about why we have to keep asking for his help over and over again? Um, that's, a that's a really good question because um, the answer is because he knows us fully and hopefully we understand that he knows us fully, all the more reason to go to Papa. Um, I, the reason why I say Papa is that was what Jesus called God, Abba. Abba translated means Papa, Daddy. Um, why wouldn't we go to Daddy all the time? I go to Daddy all the time, all the time. And I, I'm not talking about, you know, once a day. I'm talking about all the time because um, I need a lot of help, you know. Um, <laughs> where can I begin? Love, patience, kindness, self-control, understanding, you know, on and on. I, I need help with everything. So, yeah. Um, Going, going and asking for help is exactly what Papa wants me to do. I, I am uh, quite dependent on my father in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, if, if if you want to learn something, go to the world's expert on it. It'd be pretty tough to find a higher <laughs> expert. Yeah. Um, do you have any experience from your NDE? Uh, about what happens to people who die from their suicide? Um, it's interesting because uh, wasn't it Michael Shalom that did an extensive study on that? I believe it was him. And uh, what he found, I, I'm relying on, because he, he interviewed um, many, many people as a doctor um, who had um, attempted suicide, that they all said they'd never do that again. I had to do a funeral for a beautiful mother of two great children who I had in my confirmation class at church who killed herself. Hmm. Um, her presentation of herself in the church was everything's wonderful, everything's great, happy marriage, happy life. Um, and then when I, after she killed herself and I interviewed the family, I found out that that was um, an image that she projected at church was quite the opposite of the reality of what she was living in. And I did a lot of study about suicide and I came to the conclusion, um, I don't know if this is true for everybody, but suicide um, is a mental disorder. We, I've read that we are a collection of 75 trillion cells. All those cells have one imperative, one thought, one reason for existing. They want to exist and hopefully to re reproduce. And that's what they're doing all the time. You know, our skin is constantly shedding itself and producing more skin. I mean, every organ in our body is constantly renewing itself and wanting to live. Yeah, the, the idea of killing oneself, um, I, I haven't heard of that in the animal kingdom. You know, maybe there is such a thing, but it would be exceedingly rare. And I've never heard of such a thing. In the, in the human kingdom, because we uh, have such a complex mind, we're capable of that kind of thought. But it's not, it's something's wrong. And um, I think probably most of my viewers have experienced depression at some time in the life I have. And that can take you down into a very dark place, a very irrational place where you start thinking about, um destroying yourself um 
it's it's really good but that that's the the something something's gone wrong you know really really wrong it's not normal does god punish people hate people reject people who are physically disabled no does god punish hate people who are mentally disabled no does god understand people who um are going through a deep depression and do something um wildly against their best interest like killing themselves yes therefore um i don't believe that suicide many suicides are um rejected by god yeah well thank you i I've, I've always thought it had to do with motivation and you know if you were one of the 300 spartans who saved all their fellow citizens <laughs> and and essentially uh, agree to die. That's that's one thing. Selfish acts, maybe not so much. I think it's such an individual thing. It's tough to make broad generalizations here. Um, uh, parting comments, Todd. Your your thoughts, and we'll wrap this up. Well, firstly, just tagging in what you guys said with three hundred Spartans. Greater love is than no man than to give one's life for your brother. They were doing it for a reason um to save more than themselves just to let everybody know um in the background what's going on is the donation site is offline don't know why <laughs> but anyway we'll get it online by tomorrow you can try tonight they, they're aware of it it's it's technology you know technology that thing that works sometimes <laughs> most of the time doesn't the way we want to um no working with howard the only thing i can say about howard is i want him to write another book <laughs> because I've been on him like a like a tick on a dog. I won't let it go because he's got so much stuff. Knowing scripture, studying other religions, going to hell, rescued by Jesus, having this whole, and I didn't have time to talk about all this time talking to Jesus about all these different historical events, past, present, and future. I said, you got to write it down. And, and you got to surmise what you've learned from all of your experience, because it's like having, I, I, he laughs when I say this, you guys are like advanced recon. You, <laughs> Harry, Edmund Alexander, you go over the hill, you're seeing into the promised land, you're seeing into the future, you come back and you try and tell us, and we look at you like, what, what'd you say? I mean, yeah. we, we, see through a, uh, a a glass darkly we see through a veil they've actually had their eyes on what's coming they haven't gone all the way in but i i would love to have them all talk to one another and come up with something in writing that would be beautiful um howard's always affects me uh very very deeply because it affects how I was brought up, what I thought was the right thing. It makes me challenge my upbringing. And I didn't become a Christian until I was 16 years old. I was an atheist like Howard. And that's not important to this discussion, except to say that Howard has made me rethink everything. I've gone back and re-examined the things that I feel, the things that I do, I've been I've been editing my life now, Howard. <laughs> I've been I've been writing God saying, please forgive me for hurting X, Y, and Z. I've been telling people that I've heard, I'm so sorry. I've asked for forgiveness. I asked God to remind me of who I've hurt because we've hurt so many people in our lives and we've been hurt by so many people in our lives. And I think basically Howard would say, you don't have to get a response to them. You just have to have the ability to say, I recognize that I did something that wasn't right. And I need to acknowledge it. And I need to ask for forgiveness. And so that's why Howard's story just hits me so hard. It hits me right between the eyes. Because I'm a judgmental Irishman. How can I not be? <laughs> I'm from Ireland, you know? You know, so the thing is, it's like, I'm judgmental. And you can't be. That's... That's for God. God's the only person who can pull the trigger on anybody and make a decision. He knows his own. It's not our, it's not our deal. Our deal is to love people. <laughs> or I like what Mary said. I said, okay, so you got to love God with all your heart. I got that one down. I'm good on that. And then I got to love everybody else. That's the hard one. She says, <laughs> yeah, well, you, you just have to love them. You don't have to like them. <laughs> said, I love that when Mary told me that. Yeah. That's all I well want. said. But, 
part, parting thoughts, Howard, any, any final thoughts here? And then I've got a little information. We'll wrap it up. I'd like to leave people with the notion that hope is one of the most important things in the world. You know, when you wake up in the morning, um, you might have hundred good reasons why your life is a disaster and you can't take another day of it, but you get up out of bed and you uh, fix yourself up and you go about your daily stuff because there's always that glimmer of hope that something um, that you're hoping for is going to happen. And that's really one of the huge things in the Bible, um, the gift of hope. Matter of fact, it's, it's listed as one of the top three, love, hope, and faith. Um, I don't think we're delusional. I don't think we're um, living uh, about pie in the sky and the great by and by, which is used as a derisive term by the critics of Christianity. And I believe that um, the beautiful gifts that God has to give us, like love, hope, and faith, are available right now, right today, um, this moment, if we seek them. And I have been blessed with so many of those gifts. So I believe that eternity, heaven, the kingdom of God is in my life now. And I'm just, I'm just walking the paces to the fulfillment of it, which is my great getting up day when I move on. But I, I'm not living for heaven. I'm living for now, this moment. I'm, I'm trying, trying to live in this moment. And I'm trying to do it with uh, the graces that I've been given. Thank you, Howard. I have always seen your experience as not, oh, no, I might not make it. Or, oh, no, somebody else is in trouble. You could, Oh, you could have this horrible thing happen. I've always seen it as... Somebody who, as self-described, uh, way, way off track, has hope. Doesn't matter how far off the right path you've been, there is always hope. And I think that's the, the fabulous message that you have to offer is a really genuinely positive one. If we did not get to your question today, or if you think of another one later, I know for a fact Howard answers every question that goes to his website. So you can go to howardstorm.com, howardstorm.com. If you want to be in touch with Todd Huey about this fabulous film, go to lifebeyonddeath.tv, lifebeyonddeath.tv, and... On behalf of Lions, thank you for joining us today. Thank you.